Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, Romance. <laughs> Romance, bringing you the finest stories of the world's greatest romantic authors. Stories of the courage, the devotion, the adventure of love, all strung on the bright thread of romance. Tonight, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you Joseph Hergesheimer's unusual romance, The Token. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing. Delicious. <laughs> Now, here is the first act of The Token. It was by now six in the evening. I was standing at the taffrail of the Triton, watching the log line that ran from the wake and strained back as the ship worked homeward. She was a square rig ship with three masts, bound for Salem after a two years trading voyage to the other side of the world. I stood there looking back and thinking that I had no great desire to be nearing home. Just then, Seth Hawes, first mate and a good friend, came up to the rail beside me. It's you, Ben Kelly. Hello, Seth. Squally winner. We've seen worse. Yeah, we have by far. Phineas Cassidy can't sell his head. What? I said Phineas Cassidy can't sell his head. Well, why not? It's broke. That's why he can't sell it, I guess. And who broke it? Phineas himself. He broke it. It was his last one. He kept it in his bunk while he slept. Rolled over on it last night. Mashed it. You lie. <laughs> it's not his own head, I mean. It's one of them little shrunk up heads he bought from a savage in New Zealand. Four of them he had, strung on a string like onions. <laughs> well, then perhaps I'll buy it. What for, Ben? Oh, sort of a token of the voyage. Seems you told me you caliphs got a token. Yes. Yes, I've not forgotten. Now tell me, Ben. What's it look like, this family token of yours? Oh, it's just a gold coin of the Orient, stamped with a lot of strange signs. Do you really believe in it, huh? Well, Seth, it's an old family tradition I was brought up with. You see, if a caliph man gives it to a woman, then he marries her, no matter what. And you gave it to an East Balavan, huh? Just before we sailed. That seems a long time ago. Ben, you haven't much liked being super cargo on this voyage, have you? Seth, my passion's for the sea and for ships. I hate being a merchant. Well, then let your father and your brother handle the financial end. I intend to. Anyway, my training's done now. In the spring, I shall sail as master of this ship. Hmm. A ship's master at 25, huh? Yes, but this is my third voyage, and I've studied hard the whole time. Now you have, lad, I know. Well, I think you can handle it. Your father willing, of course. Two days later at noon, the Triton docked at Darby Wharf. I walked through Salem to our huge square brick house on Chestnut Street, entered, and went directly to my father's study. Come in. Good evening, sir. Sit down. Thank you, sir. You're looking well. I take it the voyage agreed with you. It did indeed, sir. The sea is good for a man. Hmm. I missed you and Bartlett at Darby Wharf, sir. Your brother Bartlett is dead. What? Dead? He died a month ago in Boston. But how? Carelessness in the form of blood poisoning. Oh. Poor Bartlett. Yes. Your mother and now Bartlett. God rest their souls. It 
seems such a pity. It is, but uh, we all die. <clears throat> now uh, give me an account of the Triton. Well, she's a splendid ship, sir. In the Canaries, she... I would like details of more importance. Well, there are about a million pounds of Madras sugar in her hold. Some 700 bags of ginger. 560 pieces of redwood. 830 bags of pepper and... 22 chests of tea. You, uh, you don't like this, do you? No, sir. Always the taste for mere ships. Ships in the sea both, sir. Hmm. Well, now that Bartlett is dead, it will be needful for you to give up the sea as a career. What? I will require you to stay in Salem. Oh, no, sir. You promised that after this voyage I'd be master on the next. There are plenty of masters. You shall remain in Salem and learn to manage our trade from here. But, sir... Also, I have spoken to Anise Balavan about this. She's a sensible girl and has no fancy for a husband eternally below the horizon. Oh. Oh, I see. So, there isn't a great deal left to be said. Arrangements will be made for, for Anise and you. I, uh, I shall give you a new house, and her mother has promised to furnish it. But, sir, that isn't what we're You planning. are, of course, uh, upset by the suddenness of the news of your brother's death. If you like, you may go to your room with no further discussion at present. Very good, sir. Uh, you will, of course, stop in at the Balavans this evening. <laughs> Angered and confused, I went to my room. There a servant brought me a dish of codfish with a green sauce and a bottle of sherry. An hour later, I went to the Balavan's house, where I was greeted not by Anise, but by her younger sister, Sumatra. Ben! How, oh, Ben, it's good to see you. Sumatra, how are you? I believe Anise is expecting me. Come, come, sit down. Thank you. <sighs> there. Now, tell me every shift of the Triton's wheel. Be a human log for me, Ben. In good time, Sumatra. Look, I thought Anise was... Oh, she'll be down presently. Uh, tell me, did the Triton do anything really exciting? Oh, I hope you came in with a sheer poles coach whipped and cross-pointed Turk's heads with double rose props. Sumatra, I assure you, I don't understand a word you're saying. Now, will you go at once and tell Anise... Oh, that... you don't? Well, then, Caleb, I hear, I hear it doesn't matter what you understand about the sea now that you're going to be a clerk. What? A mere clerk. It doesn't take much of a gale to burst your foresail, does it? Sumatra, all your life, people have thought you a joke with your language like a crazy ship's channel. Bah! Are you or aren't you leaving the sea for your father's counting house? I've had enough of your talk, Sumatra. Now, will you kindly go tell Anise that I'm waiting? Ben. Ben, do you really hate me? I mean, when you're not in a rage. On the contrary. In fact, I think that one day you'll make a fine wife for the captain of a West India lugger. For some incompetent fellow trading with Bermuda Hundred. <laughs> Oh, come now, Sumatra. Look, I, I'm sorry for the insult. Forgive me, please. Ben, don't let him do it. What? Your father. He'll ruin your life. You must stand up to him. You won't be struck dead, you know. Nonsense. I'm not afraid of my father. It's... It's something a girl couldn't possibly understand. Oh, you're wrong, Ben. I do understand. You just can't mutiny. Isn't that it? Yes. Yes, I suppose it is. But how did you... Listen, Ben. What you don't understand is that while at sea one can't meet tyranny with mutiny, it's an entirely different matter on land. I'm not sure there is such a difference. Well, you'd better be sure soon or you'll be helpless. Yes, helpless. You'll marry an and grow fat and sallow and soft. That's what'll happen to you. Well, why not? Anise stood in the doorway, slender and palely gold. I'd forgotten how lovely she was. Her soft blonde hair was like a cloud in sifted sunlight. Her skin had a warm pallor, lending a great delicacy to her beauty. Ben, how weathered and rough you look. And you, Anise, you're as lovely as ever. Come, there's an ocean of things for us to talk about and arrange. Good night, Sumatra, dear. Good night. Good night, Ben. Anise held her face gently to me. It was like a tea rose. I realized I ought to kiss her, but I felt extremely awkward. Somehow her manner suggested more that we'd been married a year than separated by the diameter of the world for two. Still, I was proud of her. In her way, she was fine and beautiful. And she possessed the Caliph token. Ben, I'm so glad you're not going to see again. Then it's true. 
You do agree with my father. Why, certainly I do. After all, you're not a common sailor, Ben. You're a caliph. And you belong here in Salem. Anise, I thought you knew what the sea means to me. But, Ben, your business will require you to be around ships a great deal. That's a poor substitute for being a master of the Triton on a world voyage. Nonsense. You'll be the real master of all the caliph ships. It's not the power I want. It's the sea and my own ship. Please, let's not quarrel on your first evening home. It's not a quarrel, Anise. It's... Ben, did you hear? Isn't it unexpectedly sweet of Mother to furnish our house? Isn't it? I suppose. Ben? Yes. Yes, of course it is. And we're going to have the most miraculous brocades and hangings. And just imagine, a French boudoir. That'll be fine. Oh, Ben, we're going to be so happy. Of course. Of course we are, Anais. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley Spearmint is really refreshing. A lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley Spearmint Gum. And now for the second act of The Token, as we return to Romance. Walking home later, I felt the icy wind as sharp as needles coming off the sea. And I thought what an odorous heat there would be tonight over the mooring at the Prince's Ghat in Calcutta. I reached our house and was laying aside my greatcoat when my father appeared in the doorway of his study. I have seen Captain Dove. He has praised your handling of the Triton's affairs. Thank you, sir. And did he report well of my navigational studies? And... Your conduct this evening, too, was admirable. I did not, in fact, quite expect such an immediate understanding of my intentions. Didn't you, sir? What's that? Nothing, sir. Very well. You must understand that from now on, not adventure, but finance will be the ruling spirit of this country. And the caliph must be at the center of affairs. And safe. Safe? Safe, you say? Sir, I loathe the money sharks who trade on the courage and faith of ships, masters, and crews. And I must protest Keep against... Keep your mutinous protest to yourself. Remember that I was a master for 20 years in my time. And I will not now brook insubordination. You will do as you're told. Is that clear? Very well, sir. Then good night. The helplessness of which Sumatra had spoken flooded me. For too long I'd seen my world as the deck of a ship, and the harsh discipline of that world was a part of my being. No, I could not mutiny. A month passed... Often I spent the late afternoon at the Balavans. Oh, Ben, I do wish you could go to the cotillion with us tonight. Well, Anise, another month and I'll be out of mourning. Though meanwhile, I must admit, it saved me from a lot of meaningless parties. Ben, I'm sure you don't mean that. Sumatra, you must go dress now. And you? <laughs> you can't insult me, little sister. And I dressed early so that I could spend this time alone with Ben. I can get ready in 12 minutes. I don't doubt that. Though most ladies take longer. Ben has told me I couldn't make myself a proper lady no matter how much I tried. Did you say that, Ben? It was rather tactless of you. Don't you know Sumatra is crazy about you? No, I'm not. Though it is true I was once when I thought Ben belonged to the sea. But now, well, I don't happen to have much respect for good people, and he's being so very good. <laughs> and what experience have you had with bad people? As usual, Sumatra, you're just talking words like a regular sea lawyer. Do get dressed, Sumatra. I swear she has salt water for brains. Ben, you, you haven't been especially nice to me, have you? Oh, come now, Sumatra. I didn't And what Anise mean... told you really is true. I even have a little picture of you hidden in my room, which I'm now going to tear to bits. Oh, what a child. But Ben, now she's gone, there's, there's something I must tell you. I do hope you won't be angry. Ben, 
I've lost the token. You've lost it? I'm afraid so. I've looked everywhere for it. I, I really have. Are you sure? Yes. And now you won't have to marry me. The charm is broken. Nonsense. Still, I'm sorry you lost it. Oh, Ben, so am I. But don't worry. It'll probably turn up. Let's hope so. Mm, come. I must hurry now or I'll be late for the cotillion. Will you help me with my cloak? After I saw Anise and Sumatra into their carriage, I wandered aimlessly down through the quiet streets to the docks and stood there for a while watching the icy water. A turn, lost and late, went out over the harbor crying and lamenting. I was suddenly depressed and thought of my life to be passed in a little scented room choked with brocade and hangings. And to throw it off, I decided upon a mug of rum at the monsoon, a sailor's tavern that lay in a street just behind me. I reached it quickly, pushed open the door, and went up to the bar and ordered a rum. How are you, lad? Seth Hall. <laughs> I knew you'd come skulking around sooner or later. <laughs> Seth, I'm glad to see you. Yeah, pick up your rum. We'll go sit in the corner and have a talk, huh? We sat down facing each other across an old plank table. And there, during the next hour, I told him the whole story, even including Anise's loss of the Caliph token. You still set great store by your little East Indian coin, don't you, lad? Well, Seth, it's a strange thing. Since she told me she lost the token, I, I have a different feeling. Huh? Oh, I'll marry her, of course, but I know I'm not in love with her. Eh? Well, you can't help that. Oh, she's a fine girl, I hear. And certainly she is, but, Seth, I feel trapped. Well, why don't you run off? You wouldn't be the first man born to the sea who did. That'd be mutiny, Seth. Mutiny, is it? Now, listen to me, lad. Your father's no longer a ship's master. He's only a father. I know, but... You forget the years I've spent under his influence. I can't throw it all off overnight. I know that, lad, but you'd better try before it's too late. Lady here. Move now or I'll bite off your other leg. <laughs> lady, is it? Since when did that drunken brute go about with ladies? Every harbor girl likes to be called a lady. Who is it? Jake Kilrain. Remember him that night in camp? <laughs> I'll never forget. <laughs> now I'm sure she's no lady. Oh, but she is. Take a look. I turned and saw Jake Kilrain's huge hulk bending over the slight figure of a girl in a beautiful green silk dress. When the bartender set two mugs of rum before him, he picked one up with drunken delicacy and handed it to me. She turned toward him, revealing her face. It was Sumatra. For a moment I was stunned, but then I got up and went over to her. Oh, it's you. Come along, Sumatra. I'll take you home. Thank you, but I'm not going home. Of course you are. This is no place... What to... are you doing? Leave her alone, you. You heard him. He said to leave me alone. That's right. She'll go when I go, and not before. Stay out of this, you drunken lout. Stay out of this? Why, I'll cripple you for life, Caleb. I'll drink your blood. Come along, Sumatra. Let go of me, you, you land shark. Let go, I... <laughs> That's the girl. Hit him again. You can handle him alone. <laughs> I released the mattress diamond at the same time, snatched a mug of rum off the bar and threw it full into Jake Kilrain's space. With a roar, I stepped back and shook his head like an angry bull. And then he came for me. I braced myself against the bar and smashed one foot straight into his stomach. He went down, gasping for air. I grabbed Sumatra and dragged her toward the door. Jake could kill a man with a bar, and he was now angry enough to do it. Look out behind you, man! I flung Sumatra from me and half turning saw Jake charging down on me with wild eyes. As he reached me, I suddenly threw myself to one side, letting him fall over my outstretched arm. Then I stepped up to him and kicked him neatly behind the ear. You did it, Ben. You did it. Uh, good work, lad. Only way anyone could have handled him. Come see me tomorrow, Seth. Happy there. But take this lady home before another rocket starts. Hurry now. We reached the street and walked along in silence. It had turned warmer, and the snow was falling in great lazy crystals. Sumatra had lost her veil somewhere, and the snowflakes would catch in her long black hair, sparkle for a moment, and then suddenly disappear. I watched her, thinking how vital a girl she was, and how difficult. You're in a rage again, aren't you? Sumatra, you ought to be in a cage. You're just wild. Oh, Ben, I nearly died at the cotillion. It was so stupid. But finally, I talked Henry Peabody into slipping out and bringing me down here. Oh? Then how'd you pick up with Jake Kilrain? That sailor? Well, I didn't pick up with him, thank you. Just that I thought it'd be fun to go into the monsoon, and, and Henry and I had a row about it. 
Then that big ape came along, so I went in with him. Don't you know the monsoon's no place for a lady? Oh, then I am a lady after all. <sighs> now, if you'll take me to your house before I go back to the cotillion, I'd like to straighten myself up a bit. Well, all right then, but let's hurry. Why? That silly cotillion will last all night, probably. When we reached the house, I noticed a light still burning in my father's study, so we slipped in quietly and turned into the library opposite. There I put a match to the fire, and then on an impulse I did a curious thing. Leaving Sumatra, I went out into the kitchen, got a bottle of champagne, opened it, gathered two high glasses, and returned to the library. Sumatra was sitting on the floor with candles before a tall mirror. Well, now you're being nice to me, and it's just what I need. You don't deserve it, of course. Oh, don't be wretched. Come, let's pour it. To the Triton. Well, I suppose I ought to go back to the cotillion soon. What will Henry Peabody think? <laughs> and whatever became of him, Henry? <laughs> that is of singularly small importance. I don't want to go. Not really, Ben. I'm so happy here with you. As she said it, she lowered her eyes for a moment and a rose flush came into her cheeks. It astonished me that Sumatra would ever reveal even a trace of embarrassment. We are so different, you and I. I hardly ever do what I don't want to. It's a good thing for your father I'm not you. It wouldn't make any difference. You'd stay ashore or go to sea, as he said. I would not. Oh, yes, but you would. No, he couldn't make me. Not about that. It's too terribly important. To my father, nothing is important except what he wants. Why argue? After all, I'm not you. And yet I believe if I were concerned, I could do what I decided with him. Decided about what? About your going to sea, of course. That's curious. What is? I suddenly realize that you're the only person besides me who is concerned. We love the same things, then. Yes. But it's more than that. What do you mean? I mean that I should be marrying you instead of Anise. Me? You marry me? Then I'll do it. In fact, I'll do it right now. Do what? Talk to your father. Make him change his mind. <laughs> now, don't get excited, you little wildcat. Of course you won't. But I will. I'm the only one who can. Ben, he's not my father. He has no influence on me, don't you see? That may be true, Sumatra, but there's a lot you don't understand about him. He can be quite violent, for one thing. Ben... If he were violent with me, would you stop him? Well, of course I would, but... All right, that's all I want to know. Come on, he's still in his study. Sumatra, no, come back here. Are you coming? She went out into the hall. I followed, knowing there would be a frightful row, but I couldn't stop her now. She knocked once, and then we entered the study without waiting. My father looked up from his table, frowning slightly. His face was white and as hard as marble under the artificial light. Why, Sumatra, what are you doing here? Mr. Califf, I suppose you do think it's strange to see me here so late with Ben... But it's even stranger than you imagine. Sumatra, let May me... May I ask what this is all about? Mr. Califf, Ben and I are married. Married? Why, oh, this is outrageous. It was, as you might guess, in a hurry. We decided only today. This is disgraceful, utterly disgraceful. Not at all. You must remember that I'm as much a Balavan as a niece, and besides, I suit Ben far better. Not that it matters, but might I ask in what possible way? I understand and agree with his ambition. What ambition? Why, to go to sea, of course. Ben isn't going to sea. He wasn't as your son, but married to me, yes, he is. No, he is not. But he is. No, no longer matters what you want. He became rigid, and then his fingers slowly reached out and closed over a heavy glass paperweight by his hand. His eyes set and icy were on Sumatra. I moved one foot slightly and gathered myself to spring on him when Sumatra, too, noticed his hand on the glass. I wish you would throw that. I'll have you dropped off the end of Darby Wharf if you do. I'm not your son. You hold no power over me. And now I think none over Ben. Do you understand that? Get out of here. Go. Go. And take Ben with you. To see? If there be any salt water in hell. Is that your only benediction, sir? It is. And you are no longer privileged to call me, sir. It slipped out for the last time. Come, Sumatra. We went back to the library and sat down. My father had been face down for perhaps the first time in his life. And it had somehow broken the spell he had had over me all these years. I could see it all clearly now. And I could see Sumatra, too. 
Her eyes were shining as I took her in my arms and kissed her. Oh, Ben. Ben, I haven't forced me on you, have I? I love you, Sumatra. But what of Anise? I discovered earlier tonight that I don't love Anise. Well, she doesn't really need love, you know. Just respect, and someone respectable to give it to her. Well, I'm no longer quite respectable, so she wouldn't want me anyway. And it's you I love. Oh, Ben, Ben, dearest. But what can we do now? Go to sea, on the Triton. What? Of course, my father may never speak to me again, but he's too selfish not to make me master of the Triton. What are you saying? Simply that now that he knows he can't keep me ashore, he certainly won't throw away all my training on some competitor. Ben. Yeah? Just don't you get any ideas about sailing off to the ends of the earth and leaving me behind all reef down. Where you go, I go. As my wife should. Really, Ben? Really, darling. Well, then you'd better do something about marrying me. <laughs> oh, good heavens, I forgot. I'll take care of it first thing tomorrow. Promise. It's as certain as, as though you had the Caliph token. Sumatra... Tonight, Anise told me she'd lost the token. You didn't by any chance find it, did you? No. No, Ben, I didn't find it. I, um, I couldn't very well, could I? When I had stolen it? Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment any time, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, always keep delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment any time, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Romance is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and brings you the greatest love stories of today and yesterday. Tonight you have heard The Token by Joseph Hergesheimer, specially adapted for romance by John Meston. Starring Harry Bartell with Shirley Mitchell and Lynn Allen. Featured in the cast were Ted Von Els, Lamont Johnson, and Barney Phillips. Musical supervision is by Alexander Courage. Next week, Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, the chewing treat enjoyed by millions, will bring you another story enjoyed by millions. John Meston's unusual romance of the Old West, Pagosa. Friends, the flood victims of Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Illinois need your help. Many are injured and homeless and you can help to give them food, clothing, shelter, medical care. You can do your part by giving through your local chapter of the American Red Cross. Be sure to listen to Romance next week when the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you Pagosa. This is Bob Stevenson speaking, and this is the CBS Radio Network.